A walk down 42nd Street with David Hartman is made possible in part by a grant from Reuters Limited. systems, research, television, around the clock, around the world. Reuters, the business of information. Hi, I'm David Hartman, and tonight, two of New York's best-loved institutions, the 92nd Street Y and Channel 13, are celebrating New York City. Having lived here most of my life, I'm partial, of course, but ours is the most energized, the most demanding, the most exciting city in the world. So it's a privilege for me to be able to take you through the heart of our city, uh, meet some of the people, see some of the places that make New York a center of the universe. We're going to walk 42nd Street from the East River to the Hudson. For years, the 92nd Street Y has been taking people on jaunts to every part of our city. Uh, so our program is really just like enjoying one of those tours. Uh, but tonight, you don't have to do the walking. Our tour guide is the remarkably enthusiastic Barry Lewis. He's an architectural historian of Berkeley, the Sorbonne, the guides tours for the 92nd Street Y, uh, teaches at the Cooper Union Forum and the New York School of Interior Design. Barry Lewis knows 42nd Street. Uh, but more importantly, Barry Lewis loves 42nd Street. Join us. Barry, most of us are moving at such Mach 2 speed in New York, we don't look up. But if we were to look up at what's around us, what can we see? You know, David, if New Yorkers ever looked up, they would probably see 200 years of history squashed together on every block of New York City. All right, here's the heart of New York City, 42nd Street. When you look down 42nd Street, what do you see? Well, I think to myself, if this was Europe, it would be a beautiful boulevard. But it's not Europe. It's New York. So what does it look like? An A-bomb a few nanoseconds after detonation. It's merchants, peddler merchants, lined up along the street, all of them hawking their wares, and all of them trying to drown out the guy next door. All right, Fred French decided to build this Tudor city. What was he trying to accomplish? This is what Tudor city looked like in 1927, when French completed it. He thought he was building a little piece of heaven on the east side of 42nd Street. But it was a pretty strange place to build heaven. Why? Because the riverfront was all factories, slaughterhouses, breweries, coal barges. There were slums on First Avenue, gangs all over the place. And so people got to look out their windows at that? That was a little piece of heaven? No way, no way. If you go to the other end of uh, First Avenue and you look up, there's nothing but elevator shafts and blank walls. All right, show us the inside of this little piece of Fred French's heaven. What's that term, Tudor Revival mean? Well, technically, David, it refers to the Tudors, Elizabeth I, Henry VIII, the 16th century. You think most Americans care? Oh, we hate history, details, dates. What we love is mock-up history. And this is history the way we understand it. Yeah, look at these windows. Look at the, the mullions separating the windows. All of this looks like handcrafted detail by happy craftsmen in the 16th century. It was all done by industry in 1925. The floor, the ceiling, beautifully detailed. And as beautiful as these details are, there's more details outside. So this was all written 400 years ago? Uh, not exactly, David, <laughs> but it certainly is trying to tell you what was on this Prospect Hill a century and a half ago. Look up there on the left. It talks about the 1827 country house that the F.W. Winthrop family had. This was the country. This was upstate New York. If you look to the right, 1877, it's Patty Corcoran's roost. And believe me, he was no upper crust elite. These were the slums. Patty Corcoran was one of the gang leaders of, the, uh, of this era in the late 19th century. 50 years after that, it was Tudor City. You know, 
This is why Americans, this is why New Yorkers need shrinks. This is not exactly good for your mental health. So here's the Ford Foundation building squished right in the middle of Tudor City, all his Tudor revival, and it looks nothing like Tudor. David, this is what I love about New York City. Two styles, they look like they don't even belong in the world together, and they're right here next to each other on 42nd Street. Tudor City, it's all about vaudeville. It's a stage set. It's all warm and fuzzy feelings. The Ford Foundation building, it's so purely reductivist, it's practically zen. Now let's take a look inside. A lot of people might say here in a vibrant city like New York, this is just wasted space. That's the whole idea, David, that they gave, the Ford Foundation gave to New York a third of an acre park enclosed in glass that they could use during the day that they could come in and enjoy. It's really one of the hidden treasures of New York. What was going on that they felt the Ford Foundation, they could build a building like this when they built it? Well, Roshan Dinkalu, the architects, when they designed this back in the 60s, they were doing what everybody was doing. They wanted to suburbanize the city. They wanted to bring green into the city. You know, it's so ironic, because today we're trying to urbanize the suburbs. Now, now we got rain. The weather changes every two seconds like the architecture, right? Joseph Patterson's newspaper, the New York Daily News, decides to build this building here on 42nd Street. Why? In the 1920s, a phenomenon was happening. All of the corporations were leaving Wall Street, and they were moving to the new corporate center of Manhattan, Midtown, 42nd Street. And Patterson wanted to be, first of all, near where his readers were, and second of all, near Times Square. Here, if you look at this photograph, you can see this is the new corporate center rising up over the tenements to the east. All of these buildings could be seen from miles away on Long Island. All right, this globe imposing place. What was the message? There had to be a message from this. Well, David, place. when Raymond Hood, the architect of the building, when he was designing it for Patterson, he said, look, Joe, he said, your readers aren't fancy faced people. He said, your readers are salt of the earth. So he, he wanted to give them an educative lobby, a lobby that would really tell them something about the world. So he suggested to Patterson the globe, a dome that's practically a planetarium, and this lobby was one of the largest weather stations in the world when it was built. Now, I know that because when I was a kid growing up in New York, they used to take us here to see this lobby. And, and this was a field trip. The Daily News was the biggest circulation oh, paper the in Daily, the world at the, the Daily time. The Daily News was the Bible of New York. I grew up in a working class neighborhood. It was under an L train. I mean, a real elevator Elevate, train. Yeah. And everybody read the news. Now, I, as an eight-year-old, just learning to read, I was thrilled that I could read a grown-up paper. And I'll never forget, when I was eight years old, seeing the Daily News out front there in front of the candy store, there was Joseph Stalin's picture on the left side, and on the right it said, Stalin dead. Even an eight-year-old could understand that. And not only the globe, but some sayings, witticisms, and so forth. Oh, here's, here's one. one. If the sun were the size of this globe and placed here, then comparatively, the Earth would be the size of a walnut and located at the main entrance to Grand Central Terminal. We're about, what, a half a block down from the Daily News building. Yeah, yeah, and well, this is where the last horn and heart it was. Do you remember the automat? Here. Do I remember the automat? Now, can you imagine this is the same street? Here's 42nd Street. There's the Daily News building. There's the automat on the corner. It was in the original building. And there's the 3rd Avenue L. Yeah. Which used to rattle along here. I can remember it well. It's gone now. This is where the entrance was to the last automat in New York City. Here, take a look at this. There's the door. There's 42nd Street, and off to the left, right over here, was the 3rd Avenue L. You went in, what happened? Well, you, you had to get your food from these automated glass compartments. 
You had to feed them nickels, and in order to get the nickels, they had to change lady. She was behind what looked like a token booth in the subway, but open. And it was my job as a kid to get the nickels. So whether you gave her a dime, a quarter, or a dollar, she could whip out those nickels faster than a crapshooter in Atlantic City. All right, where would you sit? Well, you see these tables? Wherever you found an empty seat, you'd sit down. There could be an executive on one side of you. There could be a cleaning lady on the other. And the guy across the way could be a bum making tomato soup out of hot water and ketchup. All right, so you go and you stick your nickels in the slots and open up and take out what? Oh, macaroni and cheese, baked beans, th the best custard in the world. Oh, they had fabulous food. Now, this was automated. Well, we thought it was automated, yeah. but actually, behind the scenes, there was an army of employees. What were the animal heads out of which the coffee and the milk and, as I remember, the hot water came out of? Do you remember what the animals were? Gee, no, I remember the spouts, but I don't remember what the heads were. I think a duck, a lion, and a dolphin. Oh, fabulous. Walter Chrysler makes himself a car company and then decides, I'm going to build myself a great big building. And he did. Why did he build it here? Well, for one thing, this was the new corporate center of Manhattan. Beginning in the 1920s, all the corporations are moving up from Wall Street, probably because most of the executives by then either lived in Connecticut and Westchester and took the New Haven down to Grand Central, or they lived on the Upper East Side. This was a lot more convenient than schlepping five miles down to Wall Street. How big was the building? It was the tallest in the world when it was built, as a matter of fact. Well, it lasted for six months because the Empire State Building <laughs> was right. completed six All months right. later. People say this had something to do with Fritz Lang, the German movie maker, and a German movie. Oh, uh, absolutely, how? absolutely. Now, when he came, when Fritz Lang, the German expressionist director, came to New York in the early 20s, what did he see? Down on Wall Street, these fabulous uh, skyscrapers, but they were all these white neoclassical skyscrapers with Greek temples on top and ziggurats on top. He goes back to Germany. In 1925, he makes that famous silent film, Metropolis, with these fantastical skyscrapers in the city of the future. We took a look at that film, and we copied those images here in New York within five years. So the American architects copied Fritz Lang. Absolutely. All right, what's up in the tippy top of the spire? Well, first of all, that's a stainless steel spire brand new in those days. Here, here's a picture of it under construction. Now look at that, isn't that fabulous? It's, it's under construction in the tower. They had a business person's lunch club, the Cloud Club, which is still there but closed. They had Walter Price's duplex apartment. And then above that, an observatory. But at the very top, about 15, 20 years ago, they took me up in the tower. I really didn't know where I was. It was a little dark. They take me into a little room. It looks like a bathroom but a bathroom that could be in back of a gas station. And there was only a sink and a mirror. And at the far wall, another just nondescript door. And they opened up the door, a dark, black-painted, narrow stair. But at the top, there was daylight. I go up the stair, one of those beautiful triangular windows with a fabulous view yeah. overlooking the 59th Street yeah. Bridge, the East River, Long Island, Connecticut, Jamaica Bay. And then I turned around and I found out what that little room was for. Yeah. It was the toilet. It was a John with the most magnificent view in the world. That's what's at the very top of the Chrysler building. Barry, I don't know whether you go to the movies very much, but it seems in the movies now they're destroying a lot of our favorite buildings. What's going on here? Well, you notice the building they love to destroy the most is the Chrysler building. And you know why? It's affection. They love, people love this building because it is romantic, because it has personality and character. Do they ever try and destroy the Seagram building? I mean, it's a gorgeous building, the Seagram, but it's a glass box. It just sits there. Everybody loves the Empire State, the Chrysler building, all of these Art Deco buildings. All right, now we're on the other side of the Chrysler building, and here's the Channon building. Why was this important at the time? This building basically 
symbolized the break with Wall Street. It, when it went up in 1927, it was one of the first corporate headquarters around Grand Central, followed by the Chrysler and the Lincoln, all the other great buildings around here. Also, it was the 1920s. This is not just an office building. When this was built, this is a view of what it looked like. You could see it from miles around. Nothing was as tall. Inside the building, first of all, in the basement, there was a an Art Deco bus terminal for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad so they could ferry the, their passengers from the terminal in New Jersey to Midtown Manhattan. The buses came down this ramp from 41st Street when they had to turn around. How would they turn around? That was an electric turntable. Hey, this is the modern era. 19... 1927. Seven. Above this, two stories of shops, a regular shopping mall with the tenants in the building, the people walking on 42nd Street. Oh, is this Art Deco also? Oh, this is absolutely, this is the French side of Art Deco because the in-house architects for Channon were two French fellows, René Chambelin and Jacques Delamar. So they created outside the frieze there in metal down below, the frieze above in terracotta. Inside those ante rooms to the actual lobby, all of the detail is, is exquisite French Deco detail. Even the elevator. Doors. Oh, those doors are magnificent. And they led you, not just to offices, upstairs on the 50th floor, yeah. there was a two-story, 200-seat off-Broadway theater. Certainly. Oh, it's <laughs> fabulous. It, was, it must have been wonderful. Imagine a theater in the sky. Well, that's gone. But above that was Erwin Channon's headquarters. And in his headquarters, still there, by the way, there was a bathroom, an Art Deco bathroom by René Chambalin. Now, how do I describe it? If Radio City Music Hall could be reincarnated as a bathroom, it would look like the Channon bathroom. This is the Bowery Savings Bank, 1923. It's now Greenpoint Savings. The bank was built here across from Grand Central because remember, this was the new corporate center of Midtown. The bank wanted to take advantage of that. But what I really brought you in here for was to see this floor. This is really, well, this is one of the hidden beauties of this city. Look at this inlaid stonework. Mm -hmm. It's based on the work in the, from the Middle Ages in Italy. If you go to Northern Italy, the churches, the, the Duomo, have this kind of flooring. They call it cosmetesque because back then there was a family known as the Cosmati and they specialized in this work. And you'll notice the abstract patterning. They got it from the Arabs of North Africa back in the Middle Ages when Europe was pulling their civilization from the Arab world. Isn't this a magnificent piece of work? Right, 1903, Grand Central Terminal, how visionary, how daring was it to build that building then? It's extraordinary that we began this century with this kind of achievement. It was based on two completely new technologies, steel frame construction and electric traction for long distance trains. Originally, after the Civil War, around 1870, Commodore Vanderbilt built this. This was the original Grand Central Terminal. It stood there for about 30 years, 25 years. In back of it, Look at that railroad yard, full of steam and smoke and such. Can you imagine if that was here in, in Midtown Manhattan today? Well, it is, except in 1903, when the old terminal was taken down, they used steel frame construction to double deck this train yard. They sank it below ground, it extends from 42nd to 50th Street, practically the Waldorf Astoria, and then at its southern end, I think we have a, yes, there it is. This is the new, Grand Central of the 19 zeros, the steel framed one going up. These architects, Reed and Stem and Warren and Wetmore, had been trained as professional architects in the Beaux Arts tradition that reached back to the Italian Renaissance. It taught them how to give the building a sense of presence in the city, so it really is a landmark. It taught them how to give us a magnificent facade, simple, monumental, and yet behind this very simple facade, is this extraordinary complicated building. It reaches out over this limited access highway that was thought of in the 19 zeros and inside the building, behind that facade, see those huge windows facing yeah. us? The lower two thirds are the waiting room. The upper third is a magnificent vaulted space where the New York Central Executives originally sat. Today, it's a tennis club. 
And above that, you see the decorative cornice? Yeah. It looks just like a, a pretty cornice, but hey, this is America. You know, right. we have to make sure it pays. Right. So in back of that cornice, they built an art gallery that today is the control center for Metro North. Every train on the Metro North system can be tracked from that control board. The whole complex is really a monumental gateway to New York. You knew you arrived in New York when you came to Grand Central Terminal. In this huge, magnificent space, this place, what does it mean to you personally? David, when I come in here, I think to myself, this is one of the great town squares of New York City, and that's really what it is. But it's the town square of a city within a city that was built on steel and electricity that's totally 20th century. What's wonderful is how Americans took this 400-year-old neoclassical tradition that was begun in the Italian Renaissance and meshed it with this pragmatic, high-tech talent that we have. And at the center of this high-tech city is this concourse, which, if you look around and you think how magnificent the stone, the vaulting, all of it's a stage set. These columns, these piers, we think they're solid stone. That's plasterboard from 1911. Okay. They're hollow inside our steel columns going up Above that vaulted ceiling, which everyone thinks is a real vault, right. that's nothing but a half inch of plaster hung from huge steel trusses really? that rest on the steel columns coming through those plasterboard piers. The ceiling, it was originally going to be a skylight, but the Vanderbilts ran out of money, if you can believe that, and they substituted a ceiling painted by Paul Lalleux from France, the Constellations. About six months after they opened it, one of the commuters realized the constellations were backwards. <laughs> well, the New York Central was not too happy. They had just spent $80 million, which is almost a billion dollars in our money, on this entire complex. And they suddenly had found the constellations were backwards. What did they say? Well, they must have hired a PR man. After all, this is America in the 20th century. They, they basically came up with the story that, in fact, the constellations were in backwards. They were taken from a medieval manuscript so we are actually looking at the constellations from God's point of view and not ours. Central Station, corner of 42nd Street and 5th Avenue, New York Public Library. Many people call this the crossroads of the world. Barry, why is this library so significant? David, this library is what makes this city a capital city of the world. It's one of our great institutions. They built it here at 5th and 42nd in the 1900s because this whole area was changing rapidly. The great department stores coming up 5th Avenue, Grand Central going up on the east side, Times Square being filled up with theaters. And when they put this up, it may look like a European palace, but this is an American machine for research, study, and reading. All right, what was here before they built it? Oh, it was it's fascinating how this city changes. Look at this. This was the Croton Reservoir. This is where we got all our drinking water from. They built this in the 1830s. When they didn't need it anymore, they demolished, they drained it in the 1890s, demolished it, but the foundations of this 1830s reservoir are still holding up this building today. How many volumes are in here? There should be now about 15 million in about 3,000 languages and dialects. The library 
is built, 42nd Street's developing. What happened then? David, it's amazing how fast the city changes. Now, after the Civil War, this was the best row house address in New York City. By 1910, it was all gone for buildings like Aeolian Hall. See over there where the uh, CUNY Graduate Center is? This is what it looked like when it was brand new. There's Aeolian Hall next to it. Remember Stern Brothers Department Store? Yep. Beyond that, the 6th Avenue L, and rising up in the background, the original Times Tower. Now, Longacre Square became... Times Square. David, do you hear that? I'm George Gershwin. Oh, George Gershwin. In 1924, debuted Rhapsody in Blue in Aeolian Hall. Paul Whiteman's orchestra was accompanying him. Gershwin was on the piano. Must have been a fabulous night. I wish we could have been there. know that underneath the terrace we're walking on, there are 38 miles of stacks for the library's books. All right, this is Bryant Park, named after William Cullen Bryant, great American poet, 50 years and newspaper editor here in New York. Uh, George Washington fought the British right here in the American Revolution, besides. And in 1853, this was the first site of America's first World's Fair. This is what it looked like. Now look at that. They called it the Crystal Palace. Well, it was more wood than crystal. And as a matter of fact, five years later in 58, the thing burned to the ground in 20 minutes. Now, what's all here? This was the favorite place for street musicians back in that era. And people used to come up from the city below just to hear everybody doing their stuff. All right, and years later, of Oh, course. isn't that a wonderful shot? Oh, man. Where we are sitting now, right. this was an outdoor reading room for the library. <laughs> That's a wonderful idea. Now, this is what it looked like when they redid it in the 30s. By the 70s, I don't know if we would want to be sitting here. But it's all been redone. Oh, in the late 1980s, they did a beautiful job. Hannah Olin, who did the promenade down in Battery Park City, they redid this in the 80s. Today, it's one of the favorite spots in New York City. Why is this called the American Radiator Building? Well, David, back in 1923, when they built it, it was built for the American Radiator Company. As a matter of fact, that is why the top was designed to look like a glowing coal at night. Now, is this what's called Art Deco? Oh, absolutely. In fact, this is one of the first Art Deco skyscrapers in the city. The term is French, but ironically, when we say it for skyscrapers, it's really a German style. The German expression is felt. All that functionalist architecture, it was soulless. They wanted to infuse a skyscraper with spirit, with soul. So they wanted the skyscrapers to look like the Gothic cathedrals of the modern world, and it certainly does look like a Gothic cathedral. What about the inside? Oh, they had some beautiful interiors. Look at these old views. Here's one of the public spaces. Looks like a oh. Jacobean hall. And as a matter of fact, in the background, look at that. The detail of these stained glass windows, these two figures, okay. the two radiators, this one on the left, you can see the smoke, and on the right, you got the American radiator logo. That's George O'Keefe's view. 1927, she painted that quintessential George O'Keefe. No wonder she was inspired. Now, this is the Bryant Park studio. This was built in 1901. And here we're in one of these studio apartments. This is what a studio apartment should be, not those walk-in closets they sell you today, with a fabulous two-story high living room facing north for a working artist. Beautiful fireplace made of plaster, but they used to paint it to look like wood, with the arts and crafts tile around the fireplace and a bedroom alcove in back of us with a kitchen underneath. Oh, what a fabulous space. One of the artists who lived here, Gary Melchers, who was a painter in those days, he did this probably in the 1910s or 20s, and it's a view from the studio building that gives you an idea what feeling you had when you lived in this building. Broadway and 42nd Street, the Knickerbocker Hotel. How important was this hotel to this whole Times Square area when it was built? Important. This hotel, when it opened in the early 1900s, was practically the Waldorf of its time. It was so elegant, Enrico Caruso, the great opera singer, used it for his pied à terre here in New York. And they say he used to give the public free concerts from his balcony just so he could practice. Whoa! 
now. Look at that lobby. Can you imagine the amount of money and time they spent on this? All of that lasted about 18 years. By 1920, Prohibition killed the place. And Astor, who built the hotel, died in the Titanic. Went down on the Titanic. Now, this is a view of the King Cole mural that Maxfield Parish did specifically for this magnificent bar that was in this hotel. When this hotel closed in 1920, eventually this got shipped to the other Astor Hotel up on Fifth Avenue, the St. Regis. Now, you wouldn't believe where the last reference is to this hotel today. Just follow me. Come on. I think I have a token. Oh, I've got my metro pony. I'm a modern guy. I always get lost around here, except... Oh, here it is. Now, look at that thing. Now, who, who says only Rome has archaeology? This was a private elevator or staircase from the hotel down into the subway. Absolutely. Can you imagine them getting off the subway in their evening clothes and going up to the Knickerbocker Hotel to start an evening on Times Square? Now, Long Acre Square was where you came to buy your horses, your carriages. This was Automobile Row before there were automobiles. But the New York Times moved up here from Park Row. Yes, right? in the early 19 zeros, totally changed everything. As a matter of fact, it wasn't even the Times that changed things. Look, there is the Olympia, Oscar Hammerstein the first. That's the grandfather of the Oscar Hammerstein theater. Yeah. yeah, he built this theater. He broke the barrier of 42nd Street. You know, if this was the 1850s. For the theater district, we'd be down in Soho. If it was the 1890s, we'd be in Herald Square. By the 19 zeros, the theaters were here, and they thought, Hammerstein himself thought, that in 20, 30 years, the be theater district much. would be up at 125th uh, Street. Uh. High-tech you know, transportation. You know what this guy's sweeping. <laughs> Can't imagine. Yeah, we think carbon monoxide kills us today, but the manure, I think, in those days, I wouldn't want to smell these photographs. <laughs> okay. Now, there on the left, right where the Astor Theater is, that was the Astor Hotel, one of the best hotels in the city for years. Right across the street's the Olympia. The Lyceum Theater on the right there, brand new on 44th Street. The rooftop of the Astor. Those days before air conditioning, those roofs were used. At night, you'd come up to the roof, they had cafes, they had bars, they probably had some kind of a show. Right. It must have been wonderful. Oh, this is Times Square in my period. The World late 40s, II. the early 50s. On the right, the camel sign was right over here. As a kid, I tried to figure out how did they do that? And then the next block up was the bond sign right. with the fabulous waterfall. But all these signs, we're right now going to go right into the middle of Times Square, and Tama Star is going to tell us about all these signs. Oh, that's the fabulous. My grandfather went to work for Strauss right around the turn of the century as a porter and ended up being the lamplighter of Broadway. So what is this like for you to come here to Times Square? I still feel the way I felt when I was a kid. It, these lights turn people on and they certainly light me up. Ask her. Come on, ask her. Okay. You want to know? I, I, ask I, I her. Have to know. How did they get the smoke? in the camel side. How did they get the smoke out of the guy's mouth? Aha. Uh -huh. My grandpa invented that mechanism. What we did was we got steam from Con Edison. Here in New York, steam runs under the sidewalk. Right. And we caught it in a kind of chamber behind the side. So the steam built up with water vapor. And at the back of this chamber, there was a punching thing that hit a diaphragm that forced the smoke out through a little hole, just like blowing a smoke ring. So that was Con Ed steam. It was Con Ed steam. Kind of, uh, it and it was kind of a piston mechanism. Yes. That, now you know. Now, now you know. know. <laughs> now I know. Now, t tell us what we're looking at. Go ahead. Well, this Trimble's Whiskey sign is the first spectacular that was ever in Times Square. And uh, it was right where the Coca-Cola sign is now. And this building that it was on is where our factory first was. You can see our truck here in the foreground. So when my grandpa came to work for the company, that's where he first started working. There were factories in Times Square in those days. Now, when you say spectacular, what does that mean? A spectacular is more than just an information device. It's a piece of art that has great size, high luminosity, it has some kind of animation so that it's active. 
Uh, it has all of these giant qualities that, um, that speak like a giant kinetic light sculpture. Oh boy. Okay, what are we looking at? In 1918, in just one short, less than a generation, Times Square had turned from a kind of quiet place into the great white way that we know today. You can see all these uh, spectacular displays. This was, of course, before the invention of neon. So all of these fabulous animated sculptures were done in electric lights. By the 1920s, the mechanisms had become very sophisticated, the advertisers had become very sophisticated, and just as they had for the whole century, people would gather in Times Square in the shadow of these giant sculptures. That stack or cascade of displays has had pretty much the same configuration ever since the World War I period. This sign of Jane Russell shows the kind of display technique we used in the war. Uh, you, you couldn't use electricity. Because it of the blackout. It was rationed and because of the blackout. Mm -hmm. So uh, my grandfather, Jake, thought up this idea of using these little wiggly mirrors to catch the ambient light. So that means each of these letters is a whole series of tiny mirrors. Yes, they're all one inch square. Like and a sequin dress. Like, like a sequin dress, and they would wiggle. Right? Like you flutter. see them now on uh, car washes. Yes, yeah. that's right. I was thinking to myself, it sounds familiar. Miss Youth Form was on the Brill Building, a giant display. She marched 200 feet across this display and pivoted and sat all in animated neon. She was beautiful. This is one of the most famous yes, signs of all I time. I still remember that. The Bond Waterfall was an entire block wide, 220 feet, and it had a 50-foot tall waterfall. The building is still there. And these two statues, a nude man and a nude woman, were about 70 feet tall, and they wore neon togas, which had to be put in place on the site. The draftsmen in those days couldn't figure out the complicated compound curves, so the tube benders went up there in bosun's chairs and bent the tubes right onto the sky. This really was the golden age of neon animation. This is the mid-50s. You can see Budweiser with the animated Clydesdale horses that clomped along and the wagon wheels turned. In order to make this flying eagle, we rented a live eagle and set it loose in the armory and photographed it. This was before you could get na nature films of birds flying. And uh, an animator broke the eagle's motion down into six motions uh, that we made neon overlays of so the eagle could fly in place on the sign. This was duplicated all over the country. And this is right back here also. This and is that's looking also, north here. Right? Also that's right the there. Pepsi-Cola was made all of glass. It was made during the war yes, before it could right. be lit up. And when the mm -hmm. war was over, we lit it up. And uh, Canadian Club and Admiral were both incredibly elaborate geometric animations. Just pattern after pattern after pattern. And all done with mechanical cams. Really quite remarkable in those days. Times Square is kind of a time portal. You know how they used to say, if you stand on the corner of 42nd Street and Broadway, you'll meet everyone you know? Right. Right. In a way, you can stand here and go right back through time and see the whole American century playing itself out. old Knickerbocker Hotel here at 42nd and Broadway. And we're looking west towards probably one of the most famous blocks in New York City. Here in this photograph, it's 1898. 
You want to see how fast this city changes? The first block is going to be bought up by the New York Times in a few years for their new Times Tower, which of course is going to completely change the name of the place to Times Square. The next block down, can you believe these ads? I mean, this is a city of advertising. At the very top, you see that for sale sign? Yeah. I think I know who else saw it. Oscar Hammerstein the first, because by 1899, 1900, he's built the Victoria, one of the very first theaters to break the barrier at 42nd Street. Now, was that what brought theater uptown from? Absolutely. They, everybody was down at Herald Square. They never thought anybody would go this far uptown to see a show. But Hammerstein gambled, and he won. As a matter of fact, you notice right next door, he built a second theater, the Republic. On top of both theater buildings, he built his paradise roof garden. And I'm sure this is where you came on a summer midnight show. I have a feeling the girls were a little bit less upstairs than they did downstairs. And now it's the end of the 20th century. It's time for another change. Within a year or a couple of years, we're going to have the new, look at that, huge new Reuters building. That's what's going to go on this corner. Absolutely. It's going to so. announce the 21st century. Now we're going to take a look at one of the great theaters in this city, the new Amsterdam. I am so glad they have brought it back to life. It was built in 1903, making it one of the first theaters on the street. 1800 seat music hall in the Art Nouveau style. That style wasn't too popular here, very popular in Europe. Now by 1913, Lo Ziegfeld had discovered this place and that's where he put his Follies. All right, and there are names that we recognize from the Follies. W.C. Fields, Fanny Bryce, uh, Eddie Cantor, Will Rogers, but it wasn't just, uh, you know, the Follies. There were book musicals. Irving Berlin's first musical was done here. George Gershwin, at the age of just 17, was playing rehearsal piano for Jerome Kern here. George M. Cohan performed here. Fred Astaire was here in Bandwagon. This was it. Oh, it was great. You know that upstairs, on top of the main theater, there was a small rooftop theater, about five to 800 seats. It's where they used to have the midnight frolics. Now, right across the street, look at that new victory. Here's what it looked like when it was brand new in 1900. In fact, you can see up in the corners there, you can see 1900. Oh, they really did make this look exactly like it. Oh, Hardy Holtzman and Pfeiffer did a beautiful job. And you know what's wonderful? It's devoted to children's theater. Oh, well, this is what it looked like by the 60s, you know, in the Born colorful old city. days. Right. Next to it, where uh, Ragtime's box office is, you notice there's the facade of the Lyric. Right. Now, remember, the Lyric was really on 43rd. The lobby was on 42nd. And they've saved that facade, restored it beautifully. And it actually joined up in back on 43rd the Apollo, whose entrance is down the block. Sandwiched in between those two entrances was the Times Square, the theater with the colonnade. Okay, so this, where Ragtime is now, was what, a combination of Well, where Ragtime, theaters? exactly. It's actually a brand new 1800 seat music hall. And what Byer Blinder Bell did, the, the fellows who, did, who were doing Grand Central, yeah. they took apart the two theaters, they built a brand new theater, and then they incorporated parts of the old theaters in the new one. And then on down farther... Then was the Selwyn. Right, which oh, fell down. Exactly, the, the facade fell down. The theater's still there, but the facade's gone. So it must have been amazing in its heyday in the 20s. Can you imagine going down this street? bus terminal in the country and, and probably even in the world. This place gets 7,000 buses coming through it every day. 185,000 people come through here. This is the third Raymond Hood building we're seeing on this street. Right. It started out with the American Radiator Building on 40th Street. Right. That's what he did first. Then he did the Daily News where we began the tour almost. 
And then in 1931, he did the McGraw Hill building, which was standing in front of him. Some critic called him a brilliant bad boy. I mean, he meant it obviously as a compliment, but what did he mean? Well, now Raymond Hood was, a, was an excellent businessman, but I think when they said that, it meant he broke all the rules. I mean, people had never seen skyscrapers like this. Look at this entrance when the building was brand new with 1930s, that, that streamlined uh, graphics, that mechanistic decoration going into the lobby. You knew this was a machine age. How significant was the color, which seems different? Oh, the color makes this building stand out. Now, when James McGraw came back from vacation and they had finished the building while he was away, he said, who chose that horrible color? He was told he had. His response, I must have been sick that day. But you know, we New Yorkers, we love this building. We call it the Jolly Green Giant of 42nd Street. What did he do after this? He went on to do that part of New York that seems so quintessentially New York, Rockefeller Center. Barry, thank you. Oh, David, I love the street. gave me some good advice before he left. He said, talk with the people who live and work on 42nd Street. So we're gonna do it. Mr. Mayor, what was this street like when you were growing up and, and how did it evolve? Well, LaGuardia was the first change it, by the way, because they used to have burlesque houses on the street. He got rid of all burlesque. He wanted to see burlesque get to go over to Jersey City. And uh, they instead turned those theaters uh, into legitimate uh, playhouses. Uh, and then, regrettably, uh, they went out of business and they became movie houses and generally uh, the worst films imaginable. And the street was taken over by sex shops and prostitutes and lots of crime. What is it like for you personally, having lived here all your life, to see this evolution and see what's happening right now? Well, I'm uh, delighted because uh, 42nd Street and uh, the Statue of Liberty are uh, what people know about New York City if they've never been here and what they want to see when they come here. Uh, there was a time when I would never have recommended that they come down to 42nd Street because they had gone to the very bottom. Now it's coming back. What do you think your mother and dad would have felt and thought if they were to see what's going to evolve here in the next few years? Well, uh, they would say to me, they're both now deceased, they would say to me, Sonny, that was very smart of you to plan this back in 1980. What is it like to do eight shows a week in this brand new theater? It's incredible, it's incredible. Uh, every once in a while, when we're taking the bows and the curtain call, you just sort of look up and the house lights are up just enough where you can sort of see the theater and you realize the beauty of this theater, you know, what they've been able to do to it by taking these two old theaters and turning into this one magnificent theater. And then also just to be performing on 42nd Street at this time. I know when I first moved to New York 10 years ago, 42nd Street was, you know, the scariest place in the world, you know, and I had been in a kids group when I was a kid and I had sung the song 42nd Street and I had dreamed about coming here and then when I was told, you know, that's the one street you should stay away from you know, because it's so dangerous and it's not what it used to be. So now to actually still be here at a time when it is having this huge resurgence has just been incredible. All of a sudden, here are Broadway musicals and 42nd Street's coming alive again. What does all this mean to somebody like you who has committed yourself to Broadway musical theater? It means there's hope. There, it means the theater will go on forever. It means that all the young kids can come. You know, we're, we're educating youngsters now that will certainly make our theater bigger and better. We are the theater capital of the world. Broadway is it. So why should 42nd Street, the world knows about 42nd Street. So to be here on 42nd Street with all these beautiful theaters being renovated and Broadway shows in them like Ragtime, which is brilliant, and Lion King, which is wonderful, it's, a, it's thrilling. That was a long, long time. Now, when was that? 1852, when the parish started first came here. Wow. Describe this parish and your parishioners, uh, if you can. <laughs> it's a wonderful, wonderful place. It's a real neighborhood. People really don't conceive of it as being a neighborhood because we're on 42nd Street, 8th and 9th Avenues, block away from Times Square. So people don't see it as being a parish, but it is very much a parish. Who 
designed this church? It was remodeled in the 1880s, and it was Louis Tiffany who remodeled the inside. Right now, we have one of his windows still in the church. Apparently, any of the other windows he put in were taken out in 1906 when there was another remodeling of the church. People don't realize that it's here on 42nd Street, and it is a gem. You can never tell what's going to happen from one end of the day to the next. You wake up in the morning and it's a whole new experience. Again, not only because of the church itself and what goes on here, the different activities we have and because of our school, but just because of people passing by. And you can never tell who's going to come in. A guy who needs a pair of shoes, someone who needs a sandwich, someone who's on the verge of suicide, someone who wants their palm read. It, you can never tell what's going to happen. Never, ever tell what's going to happen from one day, end of the day to the next. I mean, you are of this place, right? I am. Where I were am. you born? Born and raised on 42nd Street between 9th and 10th Avenues. And you have lived here how long? All my life. 58 years. I'm telling you my age. I don't believe it. <laughs> All right. Now, your family yes. has owned and run yes. the Poseidon Bakery right. for how long? 76 years. How many generations? It's in the fifth generation when my grandchild comes in to work for the festival. We always went to Holy Cross Church. I married in this church. Father McCaffrey married Anthony and myself, and that's 38 years ago. I baptized my children in this church, and Marco, my oldest son, baptized his son in this church, wearing his christening gown. How much do you like this place you live? I love this place. I love New York City. I wouldn't move out of New York City if you gave me a million dollars. My mother moved to Jersey, and for 25 years, every time she saw a house, she'd say, Lily, I have a house for you to look at. And I'd say, Mama, I'm not interested. The boys are not interested. We're staying on 9th Avenue. What was 42nd Street like when you came here? I took it over from La Rousse, a French woman who had opened a French restaurant, went bankruptcy. But four years before, it was a very famous, and I'm proud of to say it, the French palace. It was a plain massage parlor. Uh, I opened in 1986, 12 years ago. I didn't have much money, and people knew I was looking for a small place. And someone told me, why don't you go to 42nd Street, La Rousse, between 9th and 10th Avenue? Did you think that was a good idea at the time? I was quite time? offended. I said, listen, I am doing bad, but not that bad. <laughs> and when they started to change the street and tried to close the massage parlor, this was still the famous French Palace. And the ladies of the night suddenly became artists. And they started to paint the little cubic rooms here. It was really a very working place for <laughs> ladies of the night and the day as well. And suddenly, one painted the major one here. And uh, when I took over, of course, it doesn't go with Josephine Baker. I don't want people to think that this lady is Josephine Baker. But I thought it was so beautiful, so naive, so moving. I'm very proud to keep it. And I must tell you, I have unveiled my sleeping lady for you. The last time I showed her to New York was seven years ago. When I came here, as bad as the neighborhood was. Indeed, here, Clinton, there is a beautiful feeling of neighborhood. People care for each other. They welcome me like a new son. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They let me come into their family. And I'm very happy to see what is changing. But I hope it's not going to destroy the roots of this neighborhood. Second Street has always been, there was an attachment there of excitement. Uh, everybody remembers the 40s, the sailor kissing the girl and everything. Well, it's still that way. It's a he place to go. <laughs> I was there. But the, uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's an excitement that everybody feels. And uh, to be here on 42nd Street is a great thing. As it pushes me into a better state of life. So, that's our 
42nd Street. People working, energy, business, families, passion, creative. 42nd Street is alive. Come visit. It's worth the trip. I'm David Hartman. Good having you with us. Make it a good evening. A walk down 42nd Street with David Hartman is made possible in part by a grant from Reuters Limited. systems, research, television, around the clock, around the world. Reuters, the business of information.